The classical period of 1406 to 1606, the enduring Western view of the signature characteristics of the Ottoman military identity originated in this time frame. That view was constructed out of a seemingly endless series of European defeats against the superior Ottomans. That identity included armies composed of vast numbers of cavalry, giant cannons and bombards, relentless Janissary warriors and swarms of reckless auxiliary soldiers. It was an identity that rekindled ancient European memories of limitless Persians and Mongol hordes. It became the material from which nightmares were born, and generations of European children learned to pray from the delivery of the terrible Turk. The Ottoman army's organizational structure during most of the empire's expansion age, which was the classical period, had two main branches, a dual system that was common amongst Islamic empires pre-Turkic domination. The largest for a very long time was the Yerlikulu branch, the provincial or in Turkish the Eyalet forces, armed horse lords of the provinces, their retainers and many volunteer infantrymen. The other branch was the Kapukulu or the household troops of the Sultan. Military slaves as a professional fighting force was a uniquely Islamic idea. All Muslims in the Ottoman Empire were free, and outside of the Timariat feudal system of military service, had no allegiance to the Sultan. Though slavery was illegal under Islamic law, and the slave soldier system was in no way an Islamic one, other than it sprung up in the Islamic world by way of arrival of Turkic warriors, the Abbasids at first captured Turkic warriors as pay soldiers only later to purchase young boys to raise them as Muslims and free them. These gulams, as they were called, were a way of securing the rule of the ruling dynasty, which the Arab caliphs made effective use in internal conflicts. The Ottomans themselves drew not only on their nomadic military heritage, but also their Islamic ones as well. Many Islamic militaries were based on this duality, an infantry and or cavalry provisional army that was tribal or feudal, and a standing army that consisted of professional slave soldiers. The Ottomans, contrary to other Turkic emirates in the region, followed their Seljuk overlords who have long disintegrated, founding their own slave soldier units, the Kapukula Ojaklaru, or Hearts of House Slave, to counterbalance the very large and up until the 15th century largely independent Turkoman cavalry and raider units and later on to rein in any Timariat Sipahi who turned renegade. The Kapukulu or Jaklare, with the famous subunit, the Janissaries, remained the backbone of the entire Ottoman military system until the end of the 18th century, though not the most important unit when compared to the Timali Sipahi or even the Kapukulu Suvari Knights, the Janissary acted as the anvil to the former's hammers. The Kapukulu branch of the organization itself was way more hierarchical than the provincial side. It consisted of the Suvari, the very prestigious, heavily armoured cavalry retinue of the Sultan, which was divided into six branches. The infantry, which consisted of the training hearts, which all the Kapukula pulled their numbers from, the sappers, water carriers, palace guards, hounds keepers, and the personal elite bodyguard, the Solaks. Finally, the third branch of the Kapukula, which was the Kaniyas, mortar grenadiers and wagoners, also included separate but connected to all of them are the armourers, which provided weapons for all branches of the Kapukula Corps. The Kapukula was however a single cog in the complex centralization machine that was the Ottoman government. The Devshirme and the Harem were parts of a structure that provides soldiers, administrators and loyalty to the Sultan only. The Devshirme was a teeth to collect non-Muslim boys to provide manpower to the Kapukula system. As mentioned before, slavery was not permitted in Islam, even of the people of the book, and the Dev Shirme was criticized by many Islamic scholars of the Sultan's court. The Dev Shirme was start every seven years by an edict of Fahman. One in every 40 Christian households provided a son between the ages of 8 and 20. Big cities and islands were exempt. Jews and households with one son were also exempt. Also those living in strategic locations 
with local defense units, along with mining folk, were also exempt. A yaya basha, ranked officer, several surujus or drovers, and a secretary would accompany a stock of uniforms to selected area where local Christian priests would gather eligible boys with baptism certificates. From here, two lists were made and boys were escorted to Istanbul to join the educational system to be either Kapukul Sipahis, administrators or janissaries. The smartest would join the Ich Orlans and study in the Istanbul Palace, while the others would be Ajemi Orlans and join a different system. The next most important aspect of the government in relation to the Kapukula was the harem. A common misconception was that all the women in the harem was for the Sultan. This was not the case. In fact, the Sultan had only four wives, who were usually political marriages, and a number of, a cal- and a number of concubines, while the rest of the slaves that were bought were educated in the same manner as the boys, bar the physical aspect. When graduating, those of the Ichilans, or destined to be administrators in various provinces, were married off to these women. These systems ensured an unmatched degree of loyalty and centralization. The Kapukula allowed the Sultan to discourage rebellious noble landholders and clan, and clan leaders, while the loyal administrators represented the Sultan's word, no matter how far it was from the high port. We will not go into too much detail on the harem right now, as it is entirely complex and largely... We will not go into much detail on the harem right now, but in later videos, as it is an entirely complex discussion by itself. I will be uploading more in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for more videos on the Ottomans.